Well, good morning. Uh, it's 10.30 in Vancouver, and uh, it's early afternoon in Ontario. I hope all of you can hear me now. It's Rob Shura from ITS Canada. Um, we have two of our three presenters online. The third, Ross McKenzie, is just coming online, so if you'll bear with us a moment, we'll make sure we have everybody lined up, and then we'll be right back. Thank you very much. Ross, have we got you? Yes. Okay, I'm going to hear me. Yes, and so can the whole audience. So I'm going to mute you, and then I'll go back to my introduction. Thank you. Well, again, good morning, everyone. Um, we're just about to put the recording on, so we'll start the session now ever-evolving path we are on towards autonomous vehicles in the consumer market. In a typical passenger vehicle today, we have a hundred million lines of code, something that is expected to reach 300 million within the next five years. We've come a long way from less than half a million lines in the space shuttle program through a series of ever increasing applications, but even a smartphone pales in comparison to what onboard requirements for operating and successfully keeping running software on a vehicle requires as you're driving down the road. There are generally considered to be six primary applications for software on board a vehicle. We all know about driver assistance technologies, whether that's things like cruise control or ABS brakes, which parallels and borders in safety as much as being a driver assistance technology. Infotainment as entertainment is commonly referred to targeted mainly at passengers, but there's also new applications emerging in the well-being space, for example, sensors that detect if your head is upright as the operator of the vehicle to make sure there's alertness on the part of your operation and that your eyelids are in fact open as you drive. Vehicle management is an emerging space that OEMs and their dealer networks especially are quite interested in pursuing to keep that relationship from the showroom purchase going through the life of the vehicle for not only maintenance but an ever more important piece which is upgrades to software and operating systems on board your vehicle. And then the interaction as it relates to overall mobility and the vehicle's ability to contribute to helping you manage your path of mobility, whether that's getting an automated parking spot as you pull into the transit or commuter station and knowing where to park without having to drive around looking for a space, all the way through to being able to secure a rental bicycle when you park and want to pedal off somewhere into the depths of the urban core of a city. There's a number of onboard technologies already in place that vehicles utilize to collect information. And a vehicle today is an active data center unto itself from onboard sensors that detect slippage and engage traction control system as you drive down the road through proximity sensors as you approach the car, not even needing to hit the unlock button on your key fob, let alone no place to put your key. You just hit the start button and go. And one of the key opportunities going forward is going to be 
harnessing that onboard data that is already collected and existing in your vehicle as an independent data center and tying into that so that additional applications are drawing on already existing data. And I have an example of that coming up in just a minute. There truly is a convergence of information and communication technology in the passenger cabin. It's a, it's a convergence that borders on a clash of the titans because you've got the ICT industry who's accustomed to moving rapidly and can have things out of date or easily updated within a three to six month time frame. And we're trying to put that technology in a more robust way on board a vehicle that's traditionally been manufactured by companies who pride themselves on things like having invented the assembly line, thank you Henry Ford, and are a lot more steeped in tradition. Automotive companies have progressed in the last decade refreshing a model of a particular vehicle from an average of five to seven years. Now they do that within two to three years. But that's still a far cry from six months turnaround that we know and experience in the ICT space. And a lot of what's happening and will happen is going to be driven by that consumer demand. So the vehicle is really evolving into a conduit. It's becoming something that takes information from your smartphone as you sit down in the driver's seat and go down the road. And then if you come by to pick me up on your way to wherever it is we both want to be off to, your vehicle being smart enough to detect that I'm getting in the passenger seat and giving me infotainment options, perhaps taking my smartphone preferences and putting them through on a tablet that may be installed above the glove box in the passenger side seat. And this all ties into that evolution of urban mobility. We're rapidly moving from a mentality where everyone aspires to own a vehicle to a point in the not too distant future where everybody will want access to a vehicle. And in the process of that, it may involve a vehicle such as car sharing. It may involve an updated version of getting a ride. And we've seen a lot in the news lately with the taxi service Uber that is revolutionizing that segment of the transportation sector. And as I mentioned earlier, the ability to reserve or access a readily available parking spot to minimize your time searching. How are we going to achieve this overall connectivity? Well, onboard, real-time internet access is in vehicles now. General Motors has made a commitment to put it in every vehicle much like they have OnStar in all of their product now within the next four years. And what's that going to do for you as a driver or a passenger in a vehicle? Well, one of the main things it's going to do, it's going to empower your connectivity. It's going to allow you to tap into an onboard wireless network within a vehicle and use a built-in antenna on the vehicle as opposed to relying on connectivity from the antenna in your smartphone. It's going to perhaps save you some money and provide you a more robust communication link because you're going to use the onboard network of that vehicle and its data plan. It will also permit for enhanced passenger infotainment options and that's going to drive a whole new stream of revenue services in the passenger market of vehicle operation. As Rob mentioned, ITS Canada has a connected and automated vehicles technical committee. Bowman Tritter of Parsons is our chair. We meet monthly by a conference call. We generally have one or two guest speakers that give a 10-minute presentation in their 
area of expertise or interest and have a general working conversation to inform and enlighten in this emerging space of connectivity and vehicles. Certainly invite any of you on the webinar today to consider participating or inviting appropriate colleagues within your organization to participate. A recently released KPMG automotive report entitled Me, My Car, My Life in the Ultra-Connected Age had a very telling quote from the national industry leader for automotive at KPMG, Gary Silberg. Autonomous vehicles are only part of the story. And I was very very pleased to see that as an opening line because they are the part that engages everyone's imagination. The public talks about connected vehicles and sees the future because the end game is that Google driverless car that doesn't even have a steering wheel. But between here and getting to that point, the convergence of consumer and automotive technologies and the rise of mobility services are transforming not only the automotive industry, but the way we live our lives. And that, of all the things I've come across in the last six to eight months, I think near perfectly encapsulates where we are and where we're going. Just a quick introduction to a project here at the University of Waterloo that involved the Canadian Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association and 13 of their member companies. We took a, a Lexus SUV and QNX, a division of BlackBerry, installed their CAR 2.1 operating system on board. And then 12 other companies' technologies were integrated by our embedded software lab experts here at Waterloo to create a truly connected vehicle showcase. I'll be putting up some links as part of the final version that goes out that uh, will be available on the ITS Canada website that will allow you to read a little bit further about that and certainly happy to take questions offline as well as at the end here if there's further interest. Just to conclude, where are we going with connected vehicles? Well, according to IHS Automotive, we are rapidly moving from a point of selling 23 million vehicles last year to 152 million projected vehicles by the year 2020. And aside to that, in an equal time frame, Statista.com took a look, now this graph is based on segment by billions of euros, but if you take a look at the categories, driver assistance and safety being the bottom two on each of these bars, of the projected 110, 112 billion euros in 2020, 80 billion of that is going to be dedicated to driver assistance technologies and safety on board the vehicle. Certainly a lot of opportunities in the days to come to not only be involved as this space continues to evolve, but to monetize and profit from applications inside the connected car. And with that, Rob, I'll uh, thank you for this opportunity and turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Ross. Uh, very, very interesting. And uh, having just been at the LA Car Show, I was uh, privileged to see the announcement and release of a number of those new vehicles that are already coming along with not just the infotainment components, but also the, uh, uh, the major changes that are taking place in connectivity. And that's been a very revealing uh, and, and very uh, exciting future in terms of what, uh, what we expect from the, from the automotive industry. And ITS Canada traditionally has not had uh, a great 
uh, component of its membership from among the automotive industry, but we're anticipating that leading up to our World Congress and, and our connected vehicle showcase that we're planning for our next ACGM, that uh, the automotive industry will start to play an even larger role in ITS Canada. Ross, there don't seem to be any questions at this point, but I'll put you on, on uh, mute and I'll switch over to Michael, and then we may come back to you later. Thanks again. So, um, our next speaker, sorry, is David Pickerel, not Michael. David is uh, with IBM, and I'm going to bring David online now to make sure he's there. David, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good, good. David has 20 years of experience with IBM, and uh, at every conference that I go to, David seems to be there representing IBM, and more importantly, representing this industry, this ITS industry of ours. Uh, he's been a very strong supporter of ITS Canada. And uh, we always look to David whenever we're looking for a quote uh, in terms of what the, not the uh, automotive industry in particular, but what the smart world is unveiling for us. Um, David has been 20 years involved with the ITS industry and uh, leads the industry smart solutions team for IBM. David, I'm going to switch over to you as the presenter now, and uh, hopefully you'll catch this as it comes by. Okay. Okay, so you should have All right. control. I do have control, uh, right. and everyone should see my screen at this point. And I'll go on mute. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, again, everyone, I'm David Pickerel. Um, uh, thank you all for joining today uh, during this busy holiday season, and every, with everyone doing a lot of end-of-year stuff. I know it's always uh, it's always hard to uh, to find time, but we appreciate you joining us, uh, whether you're doing so live or uh, on the recording later on. Uh, Thank you for listening. Uh, as uh, as uh, Rob uh, has been talking about, uh, there's a lot of new things happening in technology. Uh, obviously, I come at it from the IT side and the data side. So I want to talk a little bit, not about IBM specifically, but about how the information technology, or really how the ICT industry, or the information and communications and technology industry, um, which is kind of the subject of what we call, I now call the first convergence, uh, really sees this view. We don't build cars. We don't. You know, we're not going to build roadside equipment necessarily, uh, but when you have connected vehicles and you have all this information, what you have is very, very large data streams, very, very large numbers of probes, as we would say in ITS, uh, and very, very large uh, repositories in the terabytes or petabytes of data generated, and something has to be done with that. So, uh, again, there's a lot of changes. Uh, many of them have been mentioned already. Uh, population explosion, uh, urbanization. I've verified that Canada is even ahead of the global curve in terms of the fact that so many Canadian citizens uh, live in cities in very large conurbations, as we call collections of cities like uh, uh, the, the Vancouver area or the many regions uh, around the lakes there in Toronto. Uh, and again, globalization. Uh, we want to have global standards. Uh, people don't want a vehicle that was designed to be built in the United States not be useful in Canada and vice versa, uh, even with the metric, metric conversion, uh, or across re regions like Europe and Asia. Really, car businesses and, and vehicles businesses is a global business. And again, how do you use technology to capture this in an open fashion? Uh, and again, uh, and how do you address these challenges? And that gets to my convergence. I deliberately mentioned ICT earlier because ICT is uh, is really the first convergence that's taken place, as most of us, or probably all of us know, over the past 20 or so years where you had media, you had uh, IT, telecom all converging into really one industry and it's really about a digital industry that's bits and bytes of data. Transportation of course is a much older industry than any of the industries in ICT uh, going back really hundreds, really thousands of years, you can go back to the Romans or the Egyptians or something, uh, where it's evolved as a discipline of largely civil engineering, large public process projects or major private projects like railroads, everything of that nature, uh, very focused on the physical, very focused on assets that are needed to physically move people or goods from one side of Canada to the other or around the world. Uh, 
Um, so that second convergence is really, per the title of my presentation, is really taking place between this physical and digital. Uh, and uh, they're going to be inseparable in the area of transportation and hopefully increasingly more seamless as they go along. But the idea of really using you know, modeling was mentioned earlier too, uh, historical data, caches of data, systems that learn, systems that understand regions uh, are all kind of coming together. And, and the challenge will, for the, for the re remainder of our careers and many generations to come, I'm sure, into the century is going to be how do we actually continue this merger and allow a seamless experience, ensure safety, prevents rather than encourages distracted driving, takes care of the driver, takes care of the passengers, takes care of any kind of special needs you need, helps young drivers, helps elderly drivers, etc. Language challenge drivers, which of course is a particularly uh, uh, challenging thing in Canada when you go back and forth and deal with two language, a two language system is, is there, is there of course. Um, so really we put it down to um, leverage, anticipate, and coordinate. Uh, you know, we take the information and actually use it. Most of it is siloed. Most of us that have grown up in the ITS industry know the first generations of ITS technology, ATMS systems, loop detectors, traffic counters, and whatnot, have been very stovepipe proprietary and built for a specific purpose, which is very useful that they've been built for the purpose, but they have not really been designed in fair management systems in transit, not to leave transit out uh, with a nod to CUDA here, um, have pulled in, have, have created the potential for a lot of data, but because they're stovepipe, because they're built to close standards, um, they really aren't really helping that data to scale much and be used in any kind of useful thing outside the specific discrete function they were designed for. So that's really where analytics comes in. If we can extract the data, if we can use it, uh, there's any number of functions we can use it for to ensure that we're actually coordinating resources uh, as part of the, the, the urban ecosystem, as far as, as, far as the provincial ecosystem, uh, all up to the national level. And again, big data, big data is both a challenge, it's certainly a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because the more you're able to actually tie together and analyze that data, the more you can do it. And I have kind of the two, I call it the two sides of our integrated operations for transportation platform. On the left, you have the highway side, traffic congestion, and, and of course the motorists themselves. Transit, of course, you have bus and rail, train and commuter train operations, managing schedules, uh, and just improving the computer, commuter experience. Uh, all of which I think goes to one key theme for, for particularly our government clients, uh, better ridership, more effective use of assets so you don't have buses and trams and train cars moving half full. And then, of course, the end of the idea at the end of the day is cost savings. You're not building uh, light rail systems that are not carrying passengers. You're not uh, increasing airport capacity where people could fly elsewhere, things like that. Uh, and so all of these different benefits you get at the bottom for that. Uh, and again, the traditional approach has been kind of based on necessity. Uh, transportation grew up, uh, like we can go back to stagecoaches crossing the Rockies in the 19th century almost, uh, both in the U.S. and Canada, you know, both you know, very, very big countries. Uh, you couldn't have... Um, you couldn't really have a whole lot of centralized management in the, 18, in the 1860s. People were telegraphing, but uh, if you were going through at BAM for Kootenay, you really kind of were on your own. Uh, and Civil engineers developed a very independent mentality for thinking about that. Uh, but now, as, as the information age is there, the ability to really kind of monitor everything in real time is there, to be flexible, to use different kinds of systems together uh, so that they're not redundant and that they're complementary to each other. Uh, and to, just to a uh, tremendous amount of value. It's really the same story that's been with the Internet and with the, with the uh, digital based economy before. We just have to apply it to a very fixed in its ways, well established and, and very uh, kind of old thinking system model, which is slowly happening. So it's as much a social change as it is a technological change. Odd for a technology person to say that, uh, but, uh, but it is. And of course, I have, actually have a law degree and not an engineering degree, which is somewhat rare in ITS, but not unique either. Um, so th this gets in a bit more into functionality of some of the things we're doing I'm, as IBM. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is mainly just kind of the same things, but most of these elements are familiar in any kind of ecosystem um, where um, where you uh, where you have that you have a loop detector radar system camera uh, in vehicle telematic systems which are increasingly feeding more data outside the vehicle that's the whole idea of course of the connected vehicle it's initiative here in, in the United States 
uh, which I'm sure will have some implications in Canada, in that in 2017, uh, starting in 2017, which of course happens to be the year of the ITS World Congress in Canada, uh, U.S. built vehicles will have a telematics device that will allow location and it will be mandated under the U.S. DOT's rules to do that. Uh, I'm not quite sure yet where Enquire Transport Canada is going, but there's constant dialogue in that. Perhaps somebody from Transport Canada is on, might comment on it, but perhaps not. But uh, uh, there's going to be much more of a requirement and a much more of an industry demand because at the end of the day we have travelers, uh, increasing groups of young voters uh, in the states and provinces that want to have this level of connectivity, they want to be able to access a vehicle on the streets of Vancouver or the streets of Halifax or something and drive it and use it as they need it or share car or Uber. All of this stuff needs to be managed because that's what the citizens are going to demand uh, with standardization. I'm going to hit standardization several times again because I really think that's the key thing. We've got to have open standards. Uh, a lot of the work of TC20 uh, TC204 that was mentioned is very relevant to this uh, and standard operating procedures across North America, across the, the Americas, across Europe is going to be very uh, important uh, in order to do that. And I think the, uh, the function I'll add in here too in terms of the action, uh, we have to get beyond a reactive system. We have to get to systems that actually predict outcomes uh, that are actually uh, able to say we, uh, it's, this, the, this, the the highway looks fine right now, the motorway looks fine going into the Pan Am Games in Toronto or wherever you're driving, but we need to know what's going to happen an hour from now based on incidents that just happened. The sporting event got out, there was an accident, there's a freezing rain off the lake, there's snow, there's any number of weather factors or human factors we need to account for. What can we do an hour or out more that can affect our decision making, whether I'm the traffic center operator or whether I'm the citizen trying to basically drive across metropolitan cities across Canada. Uh, and again, we've kind of been this, uh, been this into areas of focus. We don't like to call them silos because it's the idea of breaking them down, but how do you integrate operations? How do you manage congestion? How do you respond to incidents? And how do you provide smarter control for devices uh, in the era of bring your own device? Everyone's going to have their own vehicle of some degree, and everyone's going to have their own personal device. And how do you integrate this field of devices? No one's going to start issuing a standard telematics box anytime soon for cars. I don't think the industry or the consumers are going to tolerate that. Um, so here's a bit about how uh, we have use cases around the world. I don't have a lot of time to go into specific cities and the areas where we're doing this, but these are basically things we're doing. Uh, managing real-time traffic events. Uh, we've got uh, areas in Europe and a couple locations in the st U.S. states in the East Coast where we're doing this. Um, we have the ability and a lot of functionality we're building into traffic centers to uh, uh, list and adapt instantly. In some cases, even automatic um, responses uh, on, a, on some of the major sections of East Coast Turnpike. Uh, if there's an incident, the digital video analytics component of the system will actually detect the incident and call emergency services to get them there uh, and, and then notify the operator that this has happened, but savoring several potentially life-saving steps. steps. High degree of roles and permissions. We don't really want to basically take the functionality away from the human operators. The human element is going to be important for a long time, hopefully forever in our lifetimes. And it's the idea of supporting decisions, not replacing people. I want to be very clear. That's, that's our point of view there. Um, service level events, how we handle this minor event, whereas, and how are we prioritizing for the more major events uh, that are, where life and property while, uh, are, are critical while still taking care of, uh, of the minor events so that we're not missing things like filling up potholes that could cause damage even while we're responding to, say, a major chemical spill or something like that. Uh, historical analysis and planning, the idea is to capture and save as much of the data as is useful and needed for long-term planning. We don't want to have a whole bunch of people's data that we're holding for privacy. We don't really need a whole lot of personal data, but there's a lot of statistical demographic data that we can harvest that could be used for, for planning for many years to come. Uh, and again, as I said before, predicting conditions 60 minutes out, having a reactive sign, a VMS sign that tells you you're in traffic and you're going 20 kilometers an hour isn't really helpful when you're already sitting in that 20 kilometer an hour traffic. What, could you, what if you could know an hour out to take a different route or to get on a train and take via, via, via rail or something instead of driving and do a modal shift or a route shift uh, with an hour to make that decision? 
or just not go in at all. And again, reporting real-time and historical and being very clear about that in terms of this is what's happening right now, this is the trend, and kind of learning both the humans and the system learning. Uh, and again, you know, printing out reports and showing reports in a way that's helpful to your audience if you're a highly technical person with numbers or if you want a picture, that kind of thing. Uh, and then automatic clustering, basically we're doing some of this in South Florida with, with transit vehicles, noting where vehicles are clustering, indicating kind of uh, service bunching and how to deal with that issue. Here's some more functionality too. I'm not going to, this, this, this is more transit focused. I'll click through these faster because it's kind of the same principles, just applied to transit and not vehicles. Uh, situational awareness, um, executive dashboard, roles and permissions, um, again, all of the same kind of things. This is just how it looks for transit, which is different, historical, perspective, uh, and, and other things, reading out. I won't spend a lot more time on that because I want to go ahead and move on and let my colleagues go. That's really it. Uh, I'm open for questions. Um, anyone on this webinar, just mention ITS Canada. Feel free to send me a LinkedIn invitation. There's also a lot of content supporting things I've talked about right on my profile. IBM is good about letting me do that. Uh, and you can reach it there and feel free to reach me and send me an invite right at that, uh, that uh, email or just email me at that email if you want. So thanks very much and I'll turn it over uh, back to uh, Rob. Well, thank you, David, and uh, very interesting. I know that uh, the observation I made at the show in, in Los Angeles was that uh, every one of these vehicles is going to be generating oodles and oodles of data. So I don't think uh, connected vehicles is going to solve the big data problem. It's going to create a much larger situation than we currently have. Would you agree, David? Yes, absolutely. All right, so thank you. And what I'm going to do now is put David on mute and then uh, get ready to get Michael DeSantis, who's our third speaker on the line, and I'll bring up his bio at just a moment. Michael, are you there? Yes, uh, do you hear me clearly? I do, thank you. So let me switch control over to you then. Hang on a second. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to bring up your bio. So Michael uh, is the uh, chair of ITS Canada and also the president of Lynx Technologies, Inc. Uh, he's a graduate of the École Polytechnique in Montreal with a degree in civil engineering, has been in this industry for a long, long time, and has created numerous <coughs> innovative traffic management and public transit projects, in particular with uh, the AMT folks in Toronto. Um, Correction, Michael, Montreal. In Montreal, thank you. Michael is uh, also very active, as you can imagine, in the planning for our 2017 World Congress. So let me now switch over to you. Michael, do you have control yet? Yes, you do. Good. Well, thank you, Rob, and uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, bonjour et bienvenue à tous mes collègues francophones. I was considering doing a bilingual presentation, but uh, I just ran out of time, so uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, so I'd like to present some information uh, I gathered regarding the, this concept, the concept of mobility as a service, uh, a concept that I believe has the potential to uh, reshape the way we think about mobility in an urban environment. Uh, as was mentioned by Ross in his presentation, mobility in our urban environments is changing thanks in large part to recent technological innovation. Uh, in addition to your personal car and public transit, we have many more options available to us such as car, ride, and bike sharing services. And these new innovative transportation services are becoming well established in many cities. Considering these options, one wonders if owning a vehicle makes sense in an urban environment. And in fact, car ownership is in a steady decline, especially amongst the younger generation and will be even more so with the millennials coming up. I think the quote that I present here is a good representation of what is important to this generation. ITS and rapidly evolving ICT technologies are playing a key role in transforming transportation to delivering safe, efficient, sustainable, and seamless transport options. And this was presented well by, by David's presentation. As we know, the key enabling technologies allowing for this trans transformation are, are basically the wireless broadband networks, the mobile devices, but 
more for gathering data and more importantly for information dissemination and payment. The location technology and as David mentioned big data and open data that will contribute and contributes to data fusion and data mining. Recently we're seeing transportation information aggregators such as the service provided by Ride Scouts and they're becoming more and more prevalent in today's mobile environment. In this example, Ride Scout collects the various transportation options available at a given location such as bus, rail, bike share, car share, etc., and presents all this information in one simple app. The users have all the real-time transportation information in hand in order to select the best option that meets their travel needs at a given time and place. Now, mobility as a concept is a little different. Since currently mobili mobility services are provided, used, and paid for separately. The mobility as a service concept is a transport service model in which, a, in which user, a user's major commuting and trans traveling needs are met over one interface and are, and are offered by a service provider known as a mobility operator. So the mobility operator would be a company who would buy various transport services wholesale and offer them to customers together as comprehensive mobility service package. The interconnected ecosystems would consist of the transport infrastructure, the transportation services, and payment services, thereby making the whole travel experience seamless for the user. There is a natural progression towards the realization of this concept, and the prediction is that mobility as a service linking all the transportation modes will be a reality within the next five years. So as a user, you would pay a monthly basis your transportation bundle as you currently do for your mobile internet cable package. The monthly subscription would cover public transit, car share, bike share, taxis, and other modes. You select the service packages that suit your needs and in it's then up to the mobility operator to deliver those services to you. The services can be extended to families as well. The obvious benefits for users are, well, personalized services that reflect the user's diverse travel needs, seamless, well-functioning transport services, easy access to mobility by the means of a single interface, and predictable and overall inexpensive transportation costs. The concept allows for dynamic pricing for different travel modes, thereby allowing for the implementation of travel demand management schemes. As I learned at the last ITS Europe Congress in Helsinki, this concept is well underway in that city. Helsinki well, their experiment is based on a master's thesis by an Alto University graduate student, Sonia Hikkila, which lays out a roadmap for the implementation of this concept. The Finnish capital has announced plans to transform its existing public transport network into a comprehensive point-to-point -point mobility on demand system by the year 2025. But as for North Amer as a North American example of this concept, that of the mobility operator SHIFT, located in Las Vegas, comes uh, the closest to this representation. Though it does not include public transit services, its focus is connecting travelers to a whole gamut of electric vehicles, and it includes bike sharing as well. On their site, they mentioned that this uh, service would be online fall 2014, but I'm assuming now that this will probably be in the very near future, most likely in the beginning of next year. One interesting pilot project that took place uh, not too long ago uh, was in Gothenburg, Sweden. The mobility operator, in this case Ubigo, uh, was able to get a number of households uh, interested in participating in this, in this project. Uh, though it was short-lived, it did demonstrate the feasibility 
of implementing the concept. The pilot, as I mentioned, included 70 households, and that made for 190 users with well over 12,000 transactions in the five-month trial. A number of partners uh, were involved in this demo pilot, and uh, most of them are, are unknown to us here in North America, but you know, when you see the likes of the Volvo, um, it was pretty important to them. The advantages that uh, mentioned by the participants included the ease of regarding the payment uh, for the service, as well as providing access to more modes of travel. And this thereby contributed to uh, encourage modal shift, which was uh, found in the survey studies. The satisfaction overall was, was good. And uh, the majority uh, are saying that they had benefited from this concept of using a mobility uh, operator. Now, by the time, as mentioned, we've mentioned a, new t a number of times the World Congress in 2017 in Montreal, um, and it'll return here in three years, I'm certain we'll see a number of mobility as a service initiatives implemented in major cities across the globe. So in line with the theme of the conference, seamless mobility in a connected world, I expect we'll be hearing a whole lot more about these developments in this, at this event. Now, I'd like to acknowledge actually two important people who've worked on this, who are the found, actually who've been working at uh, Mobility as a Service for a number of years now. First, Sampo Hitanen, who is the ITS uh, Finland CEO, who pioneered actually the concept a few years ago and is a major proponent of this initiative, as well as Sonia Hikila of the Helsinki Planning Department as I mentioned, whose master's thesis uh, previously is the foundation of the city of Helsinki's development work in this area. Uh, for those who are interested in more about mobility as a service, I've provided their uh, links to their work. And I highly encourage you to, re to read this information. So with that, I'll pass it along to Rob. Merci. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and uh, a very interesting presentation. I was at uh, the Detroit World Congress uh, with Michael and we were able to attend a number of those kinds of sessions where people are all around the world and I can recall a couple in India and, and some in Europe and, and uh, in uh, uh, Singapore and others where mobility as a service is being tried now. Different ways of, of delivering service, different combinations of payment schemes and different, uh, uh, different types of connectivity. And again, once the services such as Uber and other uh, uh, taxi-based services or taxi replacement services start to come into, into the marketplace in a, in a bigger way, uh, and hopefully the municipalities in, in most cities will allow that to happen over time, uh, we're going to see mobility as a service become a very viable option uh, with two 30-something sons, uh, both of them with only one vehicle. I can see they're taking advantage of that already. So, Michael, I, I've still got you here, and uh, right now I don't see any questions on our question dashboard. Uh, is there anything else that you or any of the other two attendees, uh, presenters would like to say? I'll, I'll open our mics up just for a moment. We've got a couple of minutes. David, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Any comments on, uh, on Michael's presentation? Do you see this mobility as a service being a significant factor in terms of managing big data? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I, I think it will be. Um, I think it's important. I think. I think Michael hit it right on the nail as he tends to. Uh, hit the nail right on the head as he tends to. Uh, I mean, it's really the idea, and it's. It, it, he made a great comment in terms of how our young people view it. In our day, uh, talking about those of us like myself that are somewhat well beyond the age of forty, or or the older. What do they call us? Generation X. Um, you would get out of graduate school and or you'd be in school and you would buy a car to go to college and it would be a combination of a status symbol, a social tool and everything else like that and uh, it would have meaning beyond the fact that you simply owned a, a, a vehicle. Um, and it, it now it's the idea of you're not so much, and I had some great conversations in Europe about this when I was in a global role a couple of years ago, you're really not 
people, young people really don't think about it as buying a car or even necessarily buying a metro ticket. They say, I want to go from my flat here in downtown London to visit a relative in another town, or I want to go from downtown Toronto and go over to Montreal and visit someone there. Uh, how many ways can I do it? Do I ride share? Uh, and they they have a sensitivity as to price, type of mode, who they travel with, what they travel on, time cost, and their mobile device and the systems will figure this out. And the idea really that they're going to procure a service just like they pay their phone bill. Uh, many provinces and states are thinking about that already. We have a transportation account for this citizen that they can use for everything from riding the bus to paying tolls and things like that. So it's absolutely connected and I think that uh, was illustrated very well what Michael said. It's Ross. I couldn't agree more, David. And mobility is definitely the primary use case for connected autonomy, automated and autonomous vehicles. You're going to see that driving transactions, not just in the established vehicle to infrastructure space, but in the further evolution of what's continuing in vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to cloud communications. Uh, not only smart parking, which I mentioned earlier, but things like congestion avoidance as well as ride sharing, uh, let alone uh, hailing things through something like Uber. But you're seeing the emergence of these multimodal payment systems now. Um, in the greater Vancouver area, TransLink's Compass Card, it replaces over 150 different types of passes and tickets on a single reloadable fare card. And uh, in Ontario, both in Ottawa and the greater Toronto Hamilton area, there's uh, the Presto card, which has got just under a million subscribers currently, and they claim they're on track to realize two and a half million subscribers by 2016, all of that coordinated by, by Metrolinks. So this whole idea of a connected, automated, or autonomous vehicle and the integration of applications both in the vehicle and through the vehicle to your smartphone, I think is, is going to really be a catalyst in the, this pursuit of these single payment systems. I'd like to add to that another very nice example here in Montreal with the uh, our transit uh, operator, uh, their smart card system or smart card uh, integrated with our uh, communal tool, which is the car sharing uh, uh, organization here in Montreal. So that car not only allows you to take public transit, but it actually unlocks the vehicle. So this example with the car, and I'm, I'm predicting they'll, it'll be moving more on an onboard platform such as your mobile phone with NFC and, and other capabilities. Um, I think what people want and are, are clamoring about is, as like the right scout examples, in that case having inf all the information in, in one one spot. Uh, the mobility of the service, if you take it one leap forward, is actually somebody organizing that and saying, depending on where you are, time of day, or where you need to go, they'll decide the best option for you instead of you having to look for it. So uh, we see that now with, with uh, your, most of us uh, reserve online for our airline tickets and you have these Expedia and so forth that do that, uh, find the best option for you, present you options and you just click on one. Fellas, if I could jump in, uh, one of our attendees has just notified me that the question uh, dashboard is turned off. So I'm going to let Carl Kunke ask a question verbally and if anyone else wants to put a question in, Verbally, go ahead and put your hands up. We've got about four minutes left. <laughs> Carl, are you there? I, I am. You just un you just unmuted me. Thanks. Hello, Carl. Hello, everyone. How are you all? Fine, thanks. Um, question for you, Michael. And yeah, the the question panel, the text panel, is disabled, and that's probably why nobody's asking any questions because <laughs> we we are trying. Uh, but, but verbally, if you unmute us one at a time, there may be others. I can see this mass model working for Europe, but can somebody tell me how they're going to convince the private sector in Canada and the United States to, to sign contracts and agreements with the public sector so that an app provider or developer or let's call it Rogers of the future can char charge someone every month? I, I will be long dead before Metrolinx, the Société de Transport de Montréal, Uber, 
and the private taxi companies along with Metrolinx all sign agreements with each other to allow that to happen. Well, if I may, uh, nothing is impossible. And I think the same argument was held here in Montreal when, when talk about smart card, having a smart card payment. And in Montreal, there's about 17, I believe 18, 17 different transit operators. And no one thought that they would ever come to an agreement to have one single smart card to take care of the transit, uh, transit payment schemes that, that were in place at the time. So it took some time and it, and it did happen. Uh, my guess, my answer to your question, Carl, would probably be examples. If we see, ex and I, 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 I agree with you. Most likely, you'll see Helsinki and cities uh, such as Helsinki coming online with this system. But it probably takes one uh, pilot here in North America, whereby we we test the concept and we see that it is feasible. Then we move forward. So it's baby steps, and maybe it'll be before you know. By the time you're, we're, we're, you and I are, are dead, but I don't see this not happening as much as the auto, autonomous vehicle. It's not a question of why, but it's just a question of when. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a question of our. This is it's a question of our articulating the value proposition, and I. buy them rather than expecting everyone to have one in their garage for their for their three sons or what have you. Okay, so um, if you can hear me, I'm, uh, I think we're just at the end of our time now and I appreciate the three presenters that we have. Uh, again, it's Ross McKenzie from Waterloo, David Pickle from IBM, and Michael DeSantis from ITS Canada and Lynx Technologies. Uh, very much appreciate your time. Sorry to the attendees who were trying to lob questions in, but unfortunately the uh, question box uh, seems to have been disabled unintentionally because we had intended that that would be your main way to do that. Next time we will do a better job of that. Um, and we've, uh, we just want to thank you very much and make sure that uh, you are intending to uh, join us for our annual conference and general meeting in May of 27, 2015, I should say, May 24th to 27th in the national capital region. It should be a very exciting program and we should have uh, uh, a tremendous turnout uh, in terms of oh, both our membership and those interested in the connected vehicle showcase that we're planning to do there as well. Uh, the next quarterly webinar that we have in plan is for early March of 2015 uh, and the theme is going to be planning for 2017, meaning the World Congress, which is the logo is right beside it there, uh, and how can you participate. So. Again, thank you to all who attended today, and uh, we very much appreciate you uh, joining us. We'll look forward to talking to you again in the new year, and season's greetings and a very Merry Christmas to all of you. Thank you very much. I'm going to close the webinar now, and uh, we'll go back on with the presenters afterwards. Thank you. Bye-bye.